Oh, hey everybody, and welcome to the NYU Game Center Lecture Series. Uh, we're very excited to have Oria Harvey uh, here with us tonight. Um, yes, fantastic. Um, before we get started, a uh, quick shout out to the sponsors that, that make the event series possible. Um, Avalanche, Take Two, Fresh Planet, and Dots. Thank you very much for keeping the public event series going. Um, Oria Harvey is um, an amazing artist and designer, a creator of, of games and other experiences. Uh, she's half of uh, Tale of Tales, along with Michael Samian. And um, as Tale of Tales, they have been responsible for a number of really interesting and important experiments and games. Uh, g games that really push the boundary of, of what games are and, and what they can be, the kind of challenged uh, conventions and preconceptions about what ingredients need to be in a game. And they did so really early on, right? Really, really early um, exploring some of these questions that we kind of now take for granted. So long before uh, Gone Home and Firewatch and The Beginner's Guide and, and uh, all of these games which are just, you know, uh, demonstrating the, uh, the, the potential of, of experiences that let go of uh, points and explicit goals and conflict and competition as being the sort of necessary ingredient. Uh, Tale of Tales was setting the groundwork that uh, was exploring this territory and really kind of staking out uh, this this direction, I think, in a really important and influential way with uh, games like uh, Endless Forest and, and The Graveyard and The Path and, and more recently Sunset. Um, and uh, as someone who comes from uh, a background in art and specifically kind of 20th century art, one of the things I've always loved about Tale of Tales is the boldness of their vision. These, um, th these are works that are kind of aggressively looking to question and, and you know, interrogate people's preconceptions. And uh, uh, Oria and, and Michael are, are really um, energetically uh, enthusiastic um, about, you know, <laughs> all <of your> stuff. <laughs> yeah, about sort of confronting these, <laughs> these things and, um, and kind of speaking in the language of, of, the, of the 20th century avant-garde, right, which uh, is the language of manifestos or manifesta, you know, um, and, and have, have done some cool manifesto work. Um, and then uh, I think have uh, yeah, so, so and I've always, I, I've always really appreciated that as you know, as someone who, who loves those very conventions and and is, finds a lot of value in them. I also really love to have them challenged. You know, I, I think that there's some great value in um, what I like to call sort of biting the bullet of saying. Um, it's not just that, oh, everything's fine and it's all compromised and to each his own, but to actually come out and say, no, there's something wrong, you know, there's something we can do better, right? We should take the tools of games and the technology of games and the techniques of games and apply them in these other directions because that's where the true power lies. And, um, and, and being willing to really come out and say that really explicitly and, and with, with, with great strength and then follow it up with, with really powerful work that kind of demonstrates that, um, I think is, is priceless. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, um, I just wanna, uh, really, I really appreciate um, Oria being here tonight. Um, the, you know, her home base is Brussels. Um, and uh, so it was not, um, easy it was not easy to, for her to get here. Um, and we weren't sure whether she was gonna be able to make it. Um, but you know, you said uh, you really wanted to come, and so um, you were able to to make an effort to to travel through Paris um, in order to get here. And uh, I don't know what to make of yeah. the fact that that your town um, got got hit hard by by a terrible terrible thing. Um, but it does make me think of the importance of the work that you're doing, and and the you know the real stakes of anyone doing creative work yeah. and making culture um, is precisely these questions of what our values are and what and what you know what what kind of world we're trying to build together and how to sp how to speak to each other and, and how to forge a, a shared existence on this planet. Um, these are the kind of things that that, that Tale of Tales 
uh, is, is interested in. And, um, and so I'm really glad that you <laughs> came out here and, and, and made the extra effort to, to get here tonight and speak to us. Um, please join me in welcoming Aurea Harvey. Yeah, that's actually a pretty decent segue into my talk uh, because, uh, yeah, all of those things. Um, as Frank said, it wasn't that easy for me to get here today, um, but I'm really glad I came. I used to live in New York City, actually. We'll go into that. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody uh, who helped me get here because it was really messed up. Um, Jessica, especially, and I want to thank Frank for coming in at the last minute and being like, it's okay for me to come. We'll get you another ticket when my airport blew up. And um, it's and, uh, Eric Zimmerman for actually inviting me at all. That was really sweet. And because I've never been here, and it's really cool to finally be and see what this space is all like because you guys were, I mean, what they're doing here was sort of our example of what we didn't want to do for so long, but we didn't even know the reality of it in a funny way. It's like, you know, it's like the sort of formal game thing was totally not what we were into. And now it's too late. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now it's too late. Um, yeah, because this is Choosing My Own Adventure. Um, I'm Aria Harvey, and I'll be the one choosing this evening. Um, I'm actually doing a bunch of talks uh, throughout the United States. I actually wanted to go visit my mom. She lives in Indiana. And it's really hideously, heinously exper expensive to come here. So I started thinking, why don't I just go give a bunch of talks? It'll be fun, you know? Um, but it's a really strange time for me to be giving talks and lectures because I don't have a new manifesto right now. There is no new manifesto. Um, I've got nothing I'm trying to sell because I'm never making commercial video games again. Um, I don't even really have a new project, but I do have a new project. It's, it's a very big project and it's a very slow project and I'll get to that later. Um, but it's not like, you know, I'm presenting some finished thing to you all. So I was like, yeah, I was telling my mom, as a matter of fact, like, oh, I have to come, to, I'm going to come to the States and I'm going to give four talks. And she's like, okay, great. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, well, yeah, of course, of course I have something to say. I've always got something to say. Um, but it's just how to get it out of my head in a way that makes sense. So I just started typing everything out and like big monstrous text files and um, split it up into four different text files and that became my talk. So it's like, so you can't really just expect this to be like a really straightforward beginning, middle, and end kind of situation. This is sort of somewhat stream of consciousness, but I hope, um, I th hope that it's uh, going to be more like catching up with old friends, even though I probably haven't met most of you. But um, yeah, so Aria, what are you up to these days? Um, I told myself to remember also that I'm I'm an artist, not a not a anything, not an engineer, not a theologian, not a, um, a yeah writer. <laughs> so yeah, um, I just wanted to make my point and have done with it, but that's not what the way my brain works. So uh, I, once I split up the talk into four parts, I was like sitting there thinking about well, what is the thread? You know, I was hoping to see what is the thread guiding all these things that I've been obsessed with the last say six months or. So so, and I kept coming back to this idea of choosing um, things that I've chose for in my life, the fact that I've chosen not to make uh, video games, but you know, we've always had such a loose, uh, a loose definition of that, that it seems more like we're just one more time giving you guys some sort of provocation when we say we're not making video games. Perhaps, maybe that's what's going on. Um, but yeah, choosing, uh, there's this really cool Tumblr called, <laughs> You know, it all comes back to Tumblr, um, called You Chose Wrong. I don't know if you know this one. It's like the Tumblr consists of someone who is obsessively like taking just the endings of Choose Your Own Adventure books. And it's really fucking cool. Sorry, I shouldn't curse. It's really cool because it's like always these like grisly deaths, you know? So I, and to me, I was reading this Tumblr and it was feeling like it was like fortune cookies almost for my life. So I was like picking them out and going, okay, this is the name of my talk. Since it's about choosing, it's about choosing, you know, and then choosing wrong. Have I chosen wrong is my question. You know, uh, what have I been doing with my life is my question. I'm, I'm middle-aged, so yeah, I'll just come out with that so that we have this problem around this time. Um, you know, the, 
So anyway, I just thought this this was the best metaphor like for these talks that I'm going to be giving in like New York, Pittsburgh, Boston, LA. Are you crazy, Aria? What are you doing with your life, Aria? You know. So let's do a quick review because some of you know me and some of you don't, but it won't be, I hope, boring. I won't do this in a normal way. Um, we're going to talk about, first of all, my complete resume. And I'm going to give you this real quick because you guys are students and you think you're going to do some, one thing, but the thing is you're going to end up doing probably a lot more than you can ever imagine. Um, like I said, I'm 44 years old. So far in my life, my first job was in a framing store. I framed artworks for people. It's a job I got when I was 16 years old because there was a cute boy who worked there. And I thought it'd be, if, if I worked there too, that he would notice me. And, uh, <laughs> and also I would get some money on this, you know, and I would be around art. And I thought that was cool. Um, after that, I worked in a children's museum, the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, because I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. And um, I was really lucky with this. I was 18 years old and they actually wanted me to, um, to design uh, exhibits. They wanted exhibits designed from a child's, you know, a young person's point of view. So me and another two other kids were chosen um, based on our artistic merit to um, work with the staff there to do that. That was cool. And then I worked at a computer lab, Parsons Computer Lab, because I came here to go to school. So I worked at the very first computer lab at Parsons, which you guys probably don't even have a computer lab anymore because everybody's got a laptop, so it doesn't even matter. But this was a big deal. This was fantastic. This is where I learned about computers in earnest. Um, but in, aside from that, I worked in two copy shops um, because I was working my way through school, undergrad, art school. I studied sculpture. Um, so big future there. Good thing I learned about computers. <laughs> um, um, these copy stores, I found out today that one of them is still open, the Village Copier, which is right across from uh, the Parsons uh, on 13th Street. I worked there. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, um, I, then I then worked at, um, as a computer tutor um, I was fired from that job. We'll just <laughs> leave it at that. And then I worked at publishing houses, two publishing houses. I worked at Penguin. I was like, it was at the beginning when they needed, it was like a transition between old and new. I don't want to belabor all this, but I was doing computer stuff there. Um, and then there was the advertising hell slave ships, which was, um, you know, the publishing houses was before the internet. And as soon as I saw the internet, I learned HTML and like, an afternoon, like an hour, and then I immediately went out and got jobs doing HTML. I mean, this is early web. This is like, you know, so it was so simple. And like they were paying lots of money here in New York City. If you would go to the advertising agencies and work at night and you would do like stupid Photoshop work, HTML, you would just do a mixture of things. It paid really, really good. Um, so then I realized, wised up, and it was like, hey, well, if they're paying me all this money, I'll just get my own clients. So I started, this is New York after all, one can hustle. So I got my own clients and I was doing independent HTML, net art heaven, we'll call it that, because it was a little bit of everything. I was able to abandon the world, so to speak, and live in cyberspace, make art there, make work there. You know, I was a designer, I was an artist. There were, all these things were one. That was my favorite, I think, working period. Um, but then I chose video games. I chose for video games. I dropped everything at that point, made another choice, and chose for video games. And now I'm choosing dot, dot, dot. And I don't even know what that is. But even though I'm, I've chosen not to make video games, I'm hoping we can all still be friends. <laughs> and I'm hoping that when my next project is done, our next, Michael and I can come here and we can present it. Um, we're definitely going to talk to you about what it is. Um, because it's not unrelated. Um, it's still, still about this stuff for me. You know, I also chose for this as my working environment day after day after day for the past 13 years, I've opened up a program, this one, or like Blender, or something like it, one, and used this, you know. If the, the medium is software, the medium of games that we've been making, because we don't make analog games, we make computer ones, digital ones, then this is my material. This has been my material for 13 years, you know. And, um, throughout all the games, and, I, and I've loved this stuff. It's something magical and beautiful about this interface, about doing these things. The fact that this is math, but you don't have to think about it. You know, you're creating all these illusions that people are gonna believe. I've never been one of those 3D 
um, artist who obsesses over 3D and like makes this perfect, you know, realistically rendered, you know, dragon or whatever, you know, where I've like gone through the shaders and made sure everything was perfect. I've always used it pretty much like this, like, like I'm pulling stuff around, like I'm drawing in space, like I believe in that space that's behind the screen. And because to me, that was always the most inspiring thing about this environment and what we were creating. Um, so I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to show you the very first 3D model I ever made, which actually, here, I'm going to have to turn off mirroring somehow, um, or put turn on mirroring, sorry. Um, my very first model was made for the web, actually, and it was in a technology called VRML, which was like a very early web 3D thing. Now you can just do web 3D and like it's nothing. But back then you had to use VRML, which you either programmed. Um, I wish I could show you what it looked like, but we don't have time. Um, so a lot of these files were actually also in, in Vermal 1. And it, like you can't find anything that reads Vermal 1. So I had to keep going through my files till I found the Vermal 2 versions of what I was working on. It's really not crazy. I mean, it's like I was playing a lot of Tomb Raider, basically. And I loved this game. Like, I thought making games wasn't in my head yet, but I really loved this game, um, mainly for the environment. I thought it was beautiful when I played this. I was there, you know, I was so there. So what I had tried to, be, what it had been trying to do was um, to make a, a game level. And I didn't even know that's what I was trying to do. It's, it's called E8 Motel, because my site was called Entropy 8. And like, I was trying to make an alternate 3D navigation for this, so this, so people would come to my site and they would navigate my website by walking through this model. Basically, it used to have textures and stuff. It doesn't load now. Um, none of this stuff works because this is something I might get to later. Also, technology is like magical one minute and then it's gone. You know, um, so I don't know. I, I was pretty chuffed when I actually found that again. Um, I was made in some application called Three D Home Space Builder or something. You know, one. Totally misuse of total misuse of technology or something. Um, so this, you know, you guys know our games. Um, God, I hope so, because <laughs> I'm not kind of not gonna talk about them too much. I'm not gonna like go through and say, oh, the endless forest is everyone pays dear, because I'm much more interested in this case for for the material of this thing. I was looking at all this stuff and like, okay, this was an early sketch by for the endless forest by Lena Kusaite, who was our concept artist. And um, this is a character called the Sun Deer. This deer is not in the game. We really always wanted to put this character in the game, but it never happened. Um, but I always kept around this model, which was the model of the Sun Deer. Isn't he pretty? I didn't make this model. This was made by a guy named Yuri, but I've always treasured this thing, and I'm totally going to make 3D prints of it, but we'll talk about that later, too. Um, so, like, the Endless Forest, I don't know. The models that I, this is one I did make, the, the skull mask, that which everyone covets in, that, in the game now. And this is for a mask set called Valentine Deer. We made especially for Valentine's Day one year. I don't know. It's just, I like the look of untextured polygons. I just, it totally turns me on. So other things in our cabinet of curiosities, um, the, working on the graveyard was the first time I thought of, um, this was in 2008, and I started really thinking about how 3D is like sketching. Like, and it really, every time I would look at the grandmother um, in, in the 3D editor, it felt like I was really drawing. And I, I sort of treasured that moment and that feeling. Um, grandma's cane, yay, yay. Um, but significantly, the bench where that she sits on. Ooh, it's like, it's, it's, there's something magic about this bench. I mean, it's like, this is the bench she sits on. It's all, this bench also, very same model that I made, appears in the path, Ambientalite, and also in someone else's game, it appears in um, Mirror Moon by Santa Ragione. Um, the path, which is another fun one. What did I bring for the path? The path, I have the entire cast of the path, because this was the, um, this was very memorable. Look how low, low res these guys are. Look at this. It's so cute. Um, because I made all these models in two months, <laughs> and it was like running the gauntlet because I wasn't that great at 3D or anything at the time. So it's like they're very perfect yet imperfect, and I love them. But at the same time, you also have things like this is the red apartment. <laughs> I mean, everything, looking at it this way, it's all flattened out. It's all, like, this isn't just 
the tile that grandmother's house is on, it's a portal to another world. You know, if you just put a texture on this and put it in the game environment, make it live, it's, um, where are you when you're, you know, in a game? What are you looking at when you're looking at 3D models, when you're looking at, you know, something that is symbolically the head of John the Baptist? I mean, this is just a simple model, you know, but you can make it come alive. Uh, I made, brought some stuff from Bonitas, but, well, okay, those are cool. Um, it's hard for me to see my screen. Oh, the tooth that is actually modeled after my own tooth that was pulled at a certain point, and I took it and made a copy of it. The key. Wishbone, because it's good luck. Uh, let's see what else we got. Bientolete. I think I only brought one thing for that. That's the casino. I didn't make that either, but I wasn't really working on that game. I made the models for the humans, but for some reason I love the buildings. They're also modeled off of real places. Um, I have nothing for, you know, this game, Luxurious Superbia is a is a procedural game mostly, so like everything is like, the whole thing you see is like randomly generated and stuff, so there's like no really, no magical thing I can show except for this was from a, from a like prototype of it, you know, and I keep these things around. I mean, you guys have folders of like stuff that you've worked on, right? I mean, Sunset, Sunset was like a, a sort of special deal because um, I worked with a really cool uh, 3D artist um, and he made replicas. I would just send him pictures of sculptures and things that I wanted in the apartment of Sunset and uh, he would make them for me. <laughs> And I was just, and I could just come up with anything. Oh, I want that. I was like going through this, uh, websites for all kinds of uh, museums and stuff. Like, so this is a copy of a Barbara Hepworth sculpture that appears like an actual sculpture that's in the real world. And I put it into our game. Um, this is the Minotaur sculpture that was owned by Yves Saint Laurent and was auctioned off after his death by his lover. Um, and Sunset itself was like a really crazy and special game for us. Not only was it our last game, it was the game that we felt had to be our last game um, for a lot of really complicated reasons, part of which um, have to do with the, our, our sort of process for coming up with games. Um, it requires a lot of research. That's just how Michael and I are built. Um, so what we did when we were working on Sunset was we, um, it's a game where you, that takes place in South America and we couldn't actually go to South America, um, but we did go to Cuba. Um, so it was like, cause we needed to be in a country that was not democratic by nature, you know, we needed to be someplace, um, that was, uh, that where they spoke Spanish. We needed to be someplace where that we could understand what it was like to live in another system where we could meet people who, you know, had a different way of life than our own or something pretentious like that. I mean, but it was just, it was an important trip for us. And also it led us to, to the way we were writing. Um, we were writing, um, our story as if we were Angela Burns, who was the lead character, who was an American, who went to live in South America, who like, you know, was a Black Panther and who, I mean, basically this game took place in 1972 and we, Michael and I immersed ourselves in the 70s. We listened to 70s music, we watched 70s films. We tried to understand what 70s fashion was like. I read tons of Ebony magazine, Ebony and Jet magazine. I like, um, yeah, I talked to my, I interviewed my mom, I, you know, about the 70s. I tried to dredge my own memory about, like, what I remembered about the 70s, you know, which was very, I was only, like, I think I was born in 71. So it was like, I remember, what I remembered most was music, you know? And um, it was sort of, at this point, I think, when I realized that the problem with, with Sunset was going to be that we had way too many ideas that we were trying to shove into a game format. And perhaps the time had come for us to choose another way to express our ideas. Um, but we really loved the idea of the game. We really wanted to make it happen. And um, it was the first time we did a Kickstarter. The 
Louder, louder. That's how we felt at the end. Yeah. When our Kickstarter succeeded, we, we, that's how we felt. Like, okay, this is fucking great. We had like the best team of people. We were working with more people for this game than we worked on any other game. I got two cats. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> at this point, when, when Sunset started, because it was like, not, had nothing to do with Kickstarter, but it was just like, okay, finally, I'm, I, I need cats, you know. Um, so yeah, and I art directed the hell out of this game. Um, I made precious little of the models, actually. I did a ton of texturing. And I did a lot of spreadsheets and telling people what to do. And, I, and we, we picked it, like we, we took an old Playboy magazine from the 70s and we found a floor plan and we remade the apartment. And we made the apartment that Playboy envisioned in 1971. Um, I put everything in this apartment, all the art was chosen to expressly um, to, to express the character of the guy who was living here that you would never meet. Um, I, yeah, when, when things were destroyed in the apartment, it felt to me like, oh gosh, the place is ransacked. You know, what's, it, everything you do is so intentional as an artist when you're making a game. It's like, how can you like, make this look haphazard? How can I like, re wreck my own work, so to speak? Um, and on the, on the whole, I felt it was a f pretty successful game. Um, in that sense, in the sense that we had some very complex um, ideas that we were trying to, both both artistically and politically, that we were trying to put forth with the game. Um, and anyway, I'm going to show you movies now because, yeah, that's cool. It keeps me up at night, wondering if this is some kind of destiny. The new tenant wants me to clean once a week while he's out an hour before sunset. We may never even meet face to face. Ignore the <laughs> when I reach Gabrielle's home, it feels like I've entered a sanctuary, a pocket of surreal calm at the center of a city on fire. The city has a new energy, and I can feel that deep down. Cleaning the windows is soothing somehow even with the smoke rising on the other side of the glass. There was another explosion last week. You can feel the depression in this place. It feels like everyone in the city is grinding their teeth as hard as they can. Would Gabrielle even notice if I stopped coming? In the middle of a civil war, why is this the thought that haunts me? The man has this job. He brings home encrypted papers and signs them without even reading them. I stood there with my heart pounding and my face burning. I knew my brother and his revolutionary friends needed to know about this. I don't think Gabrielle left those papers out by accident. I don't know if he's a hero or a fool. Free from suspicion, this apartment seems removed from it all. Known only to Gabrielle and me. It's a hidden place where I can pretend for a little while. None of this is happening. <sighs> Come back home.
I wasn't there when the bomb tore the gallery apart, but the blast reverberates in my head, waking me at night. Men burned and died. Thanks for indulging me with that. We've never talked about sunset in public at all, only online. <laughs> I'm a little bit like impatient with all the like, you know, sales speak in that first video, which is a fine representation of the game, but it's like because there was a lot of stuff we felt like we had to do in order to sell games. And this led to a lot of tension. It was like, so not only do we have all these difficult ideas that we're trying to get out, we also have to sell this thing, you know? And that was, fraught, to say the least, because, you know, it was right around the time that Gamergate hit, okay? I'm just going to get that out of the way and say that, which made it super painful to try and sell a game like this. Um, uh, I'm not saying that that was, like, a pro the main problem, but it definitely led to an atmosphere, especially for me, like, um, and given what the game is, um, about, yeah, all these sort of political issues that we touch upon lightly because we're afraid of really going there in a way, you know? Um, so we knew before that we kind of probably needed to be thinking about our work in a different way, like beyond commercial things, like thinking about the material, thinking about the medium more so than thinking about, well, who can we get to say nice stuff about our game so we can put it in the video so that maybe someone will believe it and maybe they'll buy it, you know? When actually you know that really what determines sales of games has a lot m is a lot more um, political also or a lot more situational. It's got more to do with like your placement on the Steam page than it has to do with whether your game is any good or not. Um, Although that also wasn't the problem. I mean, there were a million problems at the time. And then one of the problems became people writing articles about what the problem was, you know, like speculating on why our game, why we decided to quit making video games. It's like when the actual truth was that we were just choosing something else, honestly. Um, 
which leads me to my next point about what I've been doing since I stopped making video games. This will go much quicker. Um, because everybody oh. is half dead. Another video. Everybody avoids everybody. All over the place, in most situations, most all of the time. I know I'm one of those everybody. And to me, it is terrible. And so all I'm trying to do all the time is just to open people up so they can feel themselves and let themselves be open to somebody else. Th that is all. That's it. I've always thought that I was shaking people up, but now I want to go at it more, and I want to go at it more deliberately, and I want to go at it coldly. I want, I want to shake people up so bad that when they leave a nightclub where I performed, I, I just want them to be to pieces. I want to go in that, that den of those elegant people with their old ideas, smugness, and just drive them insane. When I'm calm and cool and really got uh, the antenna working, you know, you know when to push and you know when you know when to not. Nobody can tell you though, you have to feel it. In any situation between human beings, it's what makes a groove. Well, what's free to you? What's, what's free to me? Yeah. Same thing it is to you. You tell me. No, no, you tell me. <laughs> no, no. Because I've been talking for it's such a long time. It's just a feeling. It's just a feeling. It's like, how do you tell somebody how it feels to be in love? How are you going to tell anybody who has not been in love how it feels to be in love? You cannot do it to save your life. You can describe things, but you can't tell them. But you know it when it happens. That's what I mean by free. I've had a couple of times on stage when I really felt free. And that's something else. That's so really <laughs> something else. Like all, 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 like, like, I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. If I, if I could have that half of my life, no fear. Lots of children have no fear. That's the closest way, that's the only way I can describe it. That's not all of it. But it is something to really, really feel. <laughs> have, you, have you, like, wow. I've noticed. Like it. a new way of seeing. Like a new way of seeing something. Thank you, Ms. Simone, for my mission statement, um, <laughs> which I went a little, like, I got a little, I was really burnt after we quit making games, after Sunset came out. It was like, and I needed to rethink about what it meant to choose, what it meant to have no fear, what it meant to be free, I guess, because suddenly it felt, it felt freeing. We weren't upset about Sunset. Um, heralding the end for us. In fact, when we announced that uh, that we were leaving games and that uh, Sunset had failed, we sold so much that we got out of debt. So <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Um, this is my studio at home, by the way. That's where I spend most of my time. I've rearranged it lately. and um, I, It's where I feel the most comfortable. It's where the magic happens. It's, it's my little space, you know. Um, I've spent my time uh, since not making video games doing lots of analog pursuits that I love. Um, thanks to my, I have this Patreon and like people like contribute to it and I've been taking printmaking classes and sending them prints. I've been like um, just generally exercising those, exercising my hands. I wanted my hands back in terms of material, painting, drawing printmaking. I've been traveling a bit here and there. We live in a really nice part of Europe where everything is sort of driving distance. I learned to drive. That's another thing. Um, I'm that American who couldn't drive. Anyway, whatever. So, yeah. First thing we did, I think, was go to Fontainebleau. Uh, and then, yeah, lots of shows, drawing. Oh, yeah, my cat. That's Ling. Get back to the cats. This talk was um, almost many things. It was almost a musical. It was also almost entirely about my catling, who is, a, who is the best game designer in our house. I mean, seriously. 
I've been I've spent a lot of time like analyzing how she plays and figuring out what her games were. So I've named them. There's ball tosser, which is more complicated than you might think. She doesn't just you throw the ball, she brings it back. She's got like rules. You throw the ball and like, you know, you have to be standing by a certain door and if you threw it underhand or overhand, this matters. Um, there was kitty goalie, which is like, you know, you roll take a little kibble of food and you roll it down the hallway and she tries to stop it before it gets past her. Um, there was cube go round, which you know you're just there's this cube thing that we have in the furniture, and you just r go around it. She runs around it in a circle, and then tries to like reverse her angle before you switch, or whatever. And feather fly, which I think all cats play, it's like a feather on a stick kind of thing, and she like just lays on her back and like goes nuts. But she, then she takes it in her mouth and like puts it in a shoe. I don't know why, but somehow the shoe is like victory. Um, let's see. On a sad note, my other cat, Louie, he died, which sucked so bad. I've never had an animal um, die so young. He was just a kitten, and he was not well um, when he was born, apparently. And um, anyway, the reason I brought that up is because while we were the whole time we were working on Sunset, all I wanted to do was play with him, and like, and then as soon as Sunset came out, he died, and I felt well, I always felt like these two things were connected. Anyway, so that's another reason I was a mess. And then this slide is intentionally left blank because of things like what prevented me to, from coming here. I've reconnected to a lot of what is going on in the world. When you're in game development, like when I think of how many years I've spent just developing games and it's always like a rush, it's always like you're on a schedule, it's always like your life is planned out for you, I sort of lost touch with actual world, like the actual real world and what was going on politically. And, and the reason that my airport was blown up, you know? <laughs> it's like, it, and, and yeah, just a million other things that, um, that I felt like I wasn't a part of, like in terms of like what was going on in the world because of my involvement with video games. And that's not video games fault, I know. It's the way I did video games. But um, yeah, it's, um, it was complicated. So when I got out of video games, first thing that happened was I got invited to a re artist retreat in Ostend, which is at the seaside of Belgium. And it was uh, basically an artistic retreat. A bunch of people were on, and we were to make projects about uh, compassion and resistance engaging with the community. And I ended up doing this huge freeze um, portrait of this band called the Ostend Street Orche Orchestra, which is a homeless uh, group of musicians, basically. They're all homeless people who played music, and so they get together and they um, do concerts. And I um, went to their play rehearsal hall and invited them all in and met them all and spent the day drawing them, like portrait live, like sit for me and I will draw you. And it ended up being this big freeze. And it was really trippy because they didn't understand why I wanted to stare at them. You know, it's like, yeah, no, it's like, it's because, and it, and it was because that was my way of showing some compassion. You are worthy of attention. I mean, they leave a music hall or wherever they're doing their concert and they just go sleep on the ground somewhere, you know? And I was just like, no, you're, you're worth something. You know, you, this is going to be interesting. We also did, went around to the two really awful drawings at the top where one was done in a chic temple and the other was in a, um, in a mosque. Um, and because we were invited to these places, like they knew we were doing this thing. And so we were invited into these um, houses of worship, basically, and, and were in invited to make art there also. And so I did some sketching there that day. Um, another thing I've been doing quite a lot of was connecting to with this hobby of mine called photogrammetry. You guys know about this, obviously, probably, probably, where you take photos of some, an object from all kinds of angles, and then you put it through software, and you get a 3D model. This was long a little hobby of mine. As you can see, I do it, and I do it badly, but I've been enjoying those mistakes. Again, it's the material, you know, and um, I've gotten progressively better at it, but I still kind of am in love with the ones where the, m m the mess shows. And then I got a connect off of eBay, and I tur immediately turned it on myself and made these th started making 3D models of myself, like as portraits. Um, so you just basically take the connect again, shoot yourself from all angles with the connect, and run it. It's running through some software in real time that's making these models. Um, I turned it on the world around me and scanned my studio, scanned my bedroom. Why? I couldn't quite figure it out. It had something to do with that material, though, that feeling that 
this was more than just polygons, that it's like, you know, there's something chunky there, there's something alive there. And I wanted to see it in an uncontrolled way, I guess, to understand what I had been doing in games all that time with my art. And could I make something else um, with this material? And, and furthermore, I think this is the last slide, I hope, um, that where I would do things like, I, this was, is a statue of Voltaire, the, the author, Voltaire by a, a sculptor named Pigalle, and it's in the Louvre. So I always go there and I like draw stuff, you know? But this time I also actually captured the sculpture. It was my first completely successful photogrammetry uh, capture. And then I printed it. It was like this cycle of life. It's like you take it, you, you know, photogrammetry is just an, an elaborate photograph. You know, you print it out and then you make a, a, a mold from that print and then you can make copies. Yeah, whatever, you know? It just felt like, okay, this stuff is not just, you know, it's what I've been saying all these years, this is not just games, it's like all this stuff, it lives, it breathes, it's part of our world, you can take things, bring it into the machine, take it out of the machine. This is like uh, fluent. This is magic. This is miracles. <laughs> this is technology. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, and, and sort of rediscovering this passion that I could have for something, you know, that uh, I have chosen for. And I feel like I went from this big depression and into this, once again, examining, um, I don't know, what I signed up for. Um, it's, it's a funny thing, this whole idea of technology being magic. You know, I found this really cool paper that was written in 1993 by this guy, Bruce Tognanzini. I don't know who he is, really, but he's written a brilliant paper. And if you can, you can Google this and find it, it's fantastic, where he talks about how um, magic, stage magic, is very similar to human interface design, the parallels, how you can use principles from magic to make your computer, pro your software better. And I was like, yes, this is what I'm talking about. This is how I felt all along. This is magic. I'm in ZBrush, right? I've got the world's masterpieces at my fingertips. I am molding them like butter. You know, I'm like clay, like, you know, in my hands, they, they become any shape and form I want. You know, this isn't marble. This isn't even clay. This is like something else. You know, I am transported into a dimension where I can just take the victory of Samantrake and, like, you know, twist it into an S. Um, I can take the Elgin marbles, the Mar Parthenon marbles, and make an I out of them. I can, you know, make an in out of, like, whatever that was. You know, the, the crouching Venus becomes my G, you know. This is something I always knew and something that is obvious to anyone who uses a program like ZBrush that obviously they want you to feel like you are working a miracle while you're doing this. Um, but how did we get here? I mean, this is, <laughs> how did I get here? <laughs> this is the simple net art, ga um, net art diagram from 1997, Ongave around, by MTAA. Um, you can find a billion different versions of this. It's almost a meme where it w this was what the internet was like in 1997. You felt like there's a computer there. You're the creator. There's the user, the end user, and the art happens in between in the, this magic zone, you know, where what is that? You don't need to know what that is. That's where the art happens. But then now today we've got this. Who, okay, did anybody else, when you first heard the phrase cloud, actually think there was something out there that was like a physical, like, cloud? Nice. Yeah, I swear, I am not even joking. The first time somebody said the cloud to me, I kept starting thinking, what, did they find some way to, like, put electricity into, like, a, a cloud? And, like, you know, like when they make, can make it rain, you know, scientists can actually make it, like shoot things into clouds and make it rain outside. It's like, is it sort of like they shoot it up and then your data is like, but no, there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer. They take all the, it's like, they give it these magic words, you know, the cloud, so that you can, you know, you, they've named that little space in between because they want you to believe in it for all kinds of reasons. Um, and people are always wanting you to believe stuff, like based on 3D models. I don't know if you guys remember this at all, but when Colin Powell tried to justify the Iraq war and he gave this really 
the passionate speech and slide presentation. You can just Google it and find his slides. His horrible photoshops and his really shitty 3D models that he used to convince like the world to go attack another country. You can start a war with that material. It, anyway, it's astounding. Um, recently, this is bleedingly new, but there's someone, um, a, these two artists, Jan Nicolai Nelis and Nora Albadri, claim to have stolen the sculpture of Nefertiti from the museum in Berlin. Um, the, the, this was a story in the New York Times swiping a priceless antiquity with a scanner and a 3D printer. And what he said they did, and they even had video, was he went into the museum where the Nefertiti sculpture is kept with a, a modified Kinect, and he swiped it around, un it was under his coat, and he swiped it around and he stole the sculpture. First of all, that was the scan, and uh, if you've ever scanned anything with a Kinect, I mean, you saw my portraits, you know how that's just not even true. So sure enough, a couple days later, there was a retraction in the Times, and they were like, oh, you know, there's been questions about this. I was like, well, you know, you could have just asked someone the day that you wrote that story, this journalist, I keep wanting to go find this journalist and ask them, why didn't you just talk to some people who knew about this, and they would have told you that, you know, and sure enough, a few days later, there was also this, this story in The Verge, the impossibility of stealing a 3,000-year-old head with a video game controller. I'm sitting there like, duh, you know? Um, <laughs> it's like, but at the same time, this was not the point. And I kept tweeting this at the, at, at the time. This was like two weeks ago or something. Like, I kept tweeting this at the time that, yes, okay, they lied about scanning it. In fact, it might have even been a case where they, someone stole the scan of the museum. The museum had a high-risk scan, and somebody took their data. And like, this is available online. You can download the model. And the uh, intention is that you download the model, and you 3D print it. And then everyone has an exact copy, exact copy of the Nefertiti head which is under like all kinds of security. Um, I've been to the museum where the Nefertiti head is. I don't have a photo of it because in that room, it's in a glass box in the center of the room. And if you get too close to it, the guard tells you. I mean, I wanted to stand in front of it and like reflect you know, her face. Her face is like right in front of your face. The, the guard told me to step away from the model. You couldn't take a photo. You couldn't do anything in that room. So I was sitting here like, yeah, right. He's got a high res 3D scan of this model. These are the photos that I have from that day where they had a, a stone, also um, Nefertiti um, bust, and then they had photos, like archive photos from when the, the sculpture was found. And so I took photos of that because I was so frustrated that I couldn't take a photo of this thing. So of course, when you know these people say you can download a, th a 3D scan that's an exact copy, I was excited I downloaded that thing and like, you know, but what are you doing when you do that? What are we doing when we 3D scan something? You know, are we stealing something? You know, really, seriously, are we stealing something? Is that where we are? It's just because that technology seems like magic. We're doing nothing more than like Fred Wilson who made this sculptural um, installation which is at the Brooklyn Museum actually. I don't know if, if it's on view, but it's a really cool thing. Um, it's like he's got, you know, here's five copies of Nefertiti. Are they exact? Is it exact enough? I mean, it, it just, it's the rhetoric around certain aspects of technology is really astounding to me. And I find it especially of interest when we're, you know, this is, these are screenshots from um, 123D Catch, which is an app you can put on your phone to do photogrammetry. You, it's free, Autodesk makes it. You can just take this anywhere, point it at objects, walk around it, and you know, it uploads it to their server, to the cloud, and it makes a 3D model for you. And these are models that people have made. They're pointing it at all kinds of things. But the most, what, mostly what you see is very banal objects, like someone's ravioli dinner, or their, their dog or something. And then you see lots of things like these. You see sculptures, like what I did, automatically, because it stands still. A sculpture stands still. And, and, it's, and also because often these are objects that seem precious, and you want to take them. So there's this, there is this feeling, even though it's not factually correct that you're taking it with you. Even I had that feeling when I was doing the thing with Voltaire. I want to take this home with me. When I've got my 3D print of that sitting on my desk, it feels like I have a copy of the... It doesn't just feel like something I could have bought in the gift shop, even though it's the exact same thing. This is the, the rhetoric of this magic thing, the talismanic power of art. 
Um, this is also sort of bleedingly new. It's a rabbit hole I fell down the other day uh, about additivism. Morishin Aliari and Daniel Rourke's initiative to talk about 3D printing and 3D scanning and all kinds of issues surrounding it and our perception of that activity um, and in some ways problematize it but also demystify it while mystifying it more. But at the same time, they have a problem with this idea because right now it's like, you know, ISIS destroys sculpture, destroys heritage sites in Palmyra, for example. And then people go, well, we'll collect all the photos from Palmyra and we'll run it through 3D, you know, um, through photogrammetry, and then we'll get exact copies of the things that were there and we're saving them. We're recreating, you know, the P Palmyra Arch has survived ISIS is being replicated in London and New York and they put it on display. And it's like, we have saved this, you know, we have a copy of this thing. But then it's sort of like, well, who has a copy of this thing? Which was what the Nevertiti hack was pointing out. That, well, the museum has a copy of this, or, you know, the rich lands have, you've gone to the poor lands where the brown people are and you've taken their artifacts once again but in digital form this time and you're not giving anyone access to it and a lot of people are into the idea of problematizing what's going on with this stuff and because it, th this is just going to happen more because people are hungry for technology right now um, as a seg this segues into a lot of stuff but this is going to be a video which you probably will, will be difficult to see because it's very dark, but the video is dark and it's got a bright light shining on it. But if this is the first time I was ever immersed in VR, it was a project called Ephemer by an artist named Char Davies. And the date, this is a screenshot of a web page. The date was June 1998 at the National Gallery of Canada. And I'm going to play the video and I hope you can see something because that's me being very low res video. <laughs> can we turn off the, yeah. Turn off the, yeah, if you can. All right, it's really short because, you know, video on the web was not a thing so much in 1998. But the deal was that you had a vest on that, can, that uh, measured your breathing. And you had, of course, that huge honking headset on that gave you something to look at. And the vest, every time you breathed in, you floated up. And when you breathed out, you floated down. You're also standing on sort of a balance board. So if you leaned forward, you moved forward. If you leaned back, you moved back. It was all rather sophisticated, but it was like, you know, you were surrounded by sensors and all kinds of stuff. And indeed, you were, had a sensor on your body. But that was the most magical thing I had ever done at that point. I thought that this was the most amazing thing ever. And if I could have had home VR at that moment, I would have been on it so hard. Like, I, I talked to her. I wanted to work for her. Char Davies is one of the people who, um, who what do you want to call it, invented, wrote uh, Soft Image. So she kind of wrote Soft Image so that she could make stuff like this. So she was a freaking amazing woman and I wanted to work with her so much and it just wasn't the time. I couldn't choose this at this point. But you know, now we have situations like this. We have home VR, the future is finally here for me and I'm so not interested in this, I can't even deal. Like, I mean, it's, it's, everything I, I mean, okay, when I had the big honking headset on, I felt like I was, being turned into some sort of alien life form who had to communicate with this software, and this was the only way that I could do it, you know? It, it, and now they've turned it into this, like, nightmare, Borg, white guy, San Francisco commodity fa fantasy thing, and it's just really nasty. And I also suddenly have this problem with this thing on your head, it's like, I don't, I can't imagine that, you know, a lot of people would even want that. It feels like a loss of, um, of agency somehow that is, that I didn't have in 1998 because I was moving. I don't know what it was, but there's a big difference in there somewhere. And I can't, um, I also have a problem with the way that um, VR is probably going to be um, 
it, it's so expensive, and the computer you have to run it on is also prohibitively expensive for most people, so what you're going to get is all the reasons I left video games. You're going to get, it's going to be a niche of a niche, 2% of 2% of people who are going to dictate what you're going to make because they're the ones who are going to buy your thing. And so, or it's going to be a slightly better situation, something that's only used for installations. You know, I give it, I give it maybe five years before the, the magic has worn off of this. And either VR won't be there, or it will have morphed into something slightly more friendly for people. Um, this is a concept that I have a lot less problem with, and that's what I call the VR opera glasses approach to cardboard, for example. I think that there's a lot could be done with this. It's not strapped to your head. You just, it's like you're peeking into something. It's like you're looking at, peering into another world. And yeah, it's not fully immersive, but come on, weren't you immersed in video games before? Didn't you feel that already? Do you really need to strap something to your head to feel like you're on another, on an alien planet or you're, you know, driving down a street? I mean, it's like, I don't know that, um, the, the idea of a VR headset is something that is going to capture anyone's imagination other than that 2% of 2% who's eventually going to come up with um, the standard way that a VR first-person shooter should be navigated. And then you're going to have to put that navigation in your game or everybody's going to say, oh, I don't understand how to, how to use this. I don't know what you're doing. You're crazy for coming up with another navigation system because that's the state of video games right now. Moving on, let's talk about God. <laughs> this is a project, I mean, um, that rabbit hole I fell down the other day about like, um, with additivism and stuff, led to some interesting places with my, in my own research about um, sacred art, religious art, um, which will make more sense in a minute. But um, this, so this is a project called Iconal Clashes, um, Eric Berglund and Clima Vala, that I really thought was beautiful. Um, they basically wrote some software, uh, an algorithm that searches um, the Mets database for um, sculptures uh, that have to do with, that have God in the title or deity or something to do with religion. And then they wrote, uh, they used, they said they used Photoshop, maybe they used Photoshop, maybe they didn't, but it tries to combine all these things into one image, like photo merge scripts and Photoshop. And um, so he get, you get all these weird combinations that make a new deity. And I thought that was really simple and beautiful. Um, other things that I think are cool, <laughs> museum selfies, which is like a hashtag on Twitter. People try to pose like famous paintings and take photos and put themselves on them. And then there's this God.js thing, which uh, is pretty funny. It's a Chrome, in a Chrome extension where, that, where you create your own religion and um, sort of disseminate it through their server. It's pretty funny. Um, a joke, but you know, I take this stuff seriously because I'm wondering how can I connect people to something, how can we use this technology to connect people to something beyond themselves without bullshitting them? You know, how can we like connect it to them, connect themselves to themselves? Um, and that's something that I think happens in the real world all the time um, w through other types of material. This Sistine Chapel YouTube thing, you can't take, I don't know if you've been to Sistine Chapel, you can't take photos in that room. You will not be allowed. But if you go to YouTube and you look for Sistine Chapel, there are hundreds of Sistine Chapel videos. People take their like, you know, camera underneath their coat, you know, and they're like filming like, you know, the Sistine Chapel. You don't, you know, and I'm like, well, okay, that's, brings up a couple different issues. First of all, you're not allowed to take photos or video in that room because, you know, it was sponsored, the, the renovation of the room was sponsored by some Japanese company that has the photo rights. It's like a dumb reason. But then also, there are hundred pe hundreds of people who have taken photos of this room and videos. You don't need your own. You can just go to YouTube and type it in and there's like hundreds and thousands of these things, you know, it's like, or Flickr, I mean, where people have taken surreptitious photos. I did the same thing when I was there. I took a sneaky shot. It's like, why do you do that? And it's something about the fact that there's the virtual is real somehow. Millions of people go there every year and in some ways all the tourists going into that room are ruining the paintings. And you wonder, well, if virtual is real in some way, can't a virtual thing have some impact for you? Um, this is an image of a staircase called the Scala Santa in Rome. 
which was brought back to Rome. It was brought from the Middle East by uh, St. Helena, who was the mother of Constantine the Great, who was the first emperor to become a Christian. He turned Rome, the Roman Empire into a Christian land. He sent his mother out to the Holy Land to find relics, basically. She brought back the true cross that Jesus was, you know, was nailed to, she said. Um, they brought back this staircase, which was the staircase uh, to the palace of uh, Pontius Pilate, um, and supposedly the staircase that Jesus climbed when he was going to meet his fate. So in Rome, there is a chapel, and in that chapel is a staircase that leads to nothing. And people climb it. It's got 28 stairs, and you're supposed to, say, you're supposed to climb it on your knees, and you say a prayer for every stair. Is this actually the staircase that Jesus climbed to go to the cross, you know, to meet his, you know, to be judged? There are copies of this stair of a staircase called that has the same function. Copies of this staircase in like Prague, there's, a, you know, in Czech Republic. I mean, there's like in Hungary. I mean, there's there's copies of, you know, where they go, people go and they climb it and they do the same thing. And I'm just like, and and it's just. But it doesn't matter, I guess is what I'm trying to say. The virtual is real, so it doesn't matter whether this is the real thing, whether any of the re relics are real, whether any of those miracles happened. People still believe, and that's m got more to do with them than it has to do with that thing. And to me, that is fascinating. And that's why we're making Cathedral in the Clouds, which is our current project. I'm not being sacrificed by monks. Um, Michael and I have this like long history of making religious art <laughs> or art that's sort of about religion or uses religion or something. I don't know what you want to call it. We've got a thing. Even though he and I are not religious, like, like we, it's hard to say. It's more like we believe in everything <laughs> and we're kind of funny. Um, but one of the first projects we made together was this one. It was actually a website. It's going to make noise in a minute. Um, but we <coughs> turned it into some sculpture. I mean, it's some sculpture, into some software um, in 2006 to sort of memorialize it. And it's good because the websites don't work anymore, what this used to be. doesn't work anymore. Um, I'm not going to play it, but it's sort of like... Michael and I, um, our proto video game phase, like before we just chose for video games, we were making these sort of very playful website things, net art things. And um, the God Love Museum was, we thought when we started in 1999, <laughs> I'll stop sighing, um, that we would do every book of the Bible. It, it's like every, every one of these, it's only loosely based on the Bible anyway. It's like, it's about our meeting, uh, it's, it's autobiographical, it's about sex, it's about like all these her epic emotions that we were feeling when he and I met and started making artwork together. And um, I don't know, it was sort of, it felt so significant that the only thing we could think of that could equate with it was maybe some operatic thing. We thought about writing an opera, but then we were like, no, we'll just make interpretations of the Bible. I don't know. We just have it like that. Um, so we made a lot of things. I won't really go into it, but I will t talk about this one real quick. This was called Eden.Garden, which is another sort of proto-game thing we made in 2001, um, where it was commissioned actually by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> it doesn't run anymore either. Technology. Um, um, but it uh, was basically, it generated a 3D Garden of Eden um, based on the data, com data stream coming from a web page. So you could type in any website, it would go through and parse all the text, find the tags in HTML tags, and turn those HTML tags into animals, <laughs> into, uh, yeah, like, uh, into the sky, into the earth, and, and there was always a snake in there somewhere. Um, but it was pretty amusing. and. Oh, yeah, and we were, let me see if I can find another. Um, Michael and I were Adam and Eve. We, like, made little models where I was Eve, he was Adam. We were dancing. We were doing, actually, parodies of quake moves, like walk, fall, examine, like, all this other stuff. Like, yeah, it's hard to explain, but it was really funny. So there was a quake connection in there. We, yeah, we were destined to make games. I can't complain. Um, so yeah, that's like all the ideas we ever had about this stuff. But, um, and this is the last section of my talk, so 
hold on. Um, all right, Cathedral in the Clouds. This is the stuff we were looking at. It's, this is actually my favorite kind of art. Is this, I live, okay, I should also start preface by saying I live in Flanders, which if you've heard of it, you probably associate it with Renaissance painting. Northern Renaissance painting started there. Van e Jan van Eyck uh, s pretty much invented oil paint and his brother Hubert van Eyck pretty much invented oil paint. Um, so there's an awful lot of this in Flanders. Um, and the beauty that we always see in this type of painting has to do with the synthetic image. We call it the synthetic image, okay? Um, and that's meaning it's before photography. It's a world, you're, you're trying to paint a world where you have to filter it through yourself. You don't have this photographer's eye. You don't have a lens. You only have your, your body. You have your eye. It's something we cannot do anymore as a people, as a humanity, because cameras are so pervasive. Even in video games, I'll just say this as an aside, in 3D games, you, you deal with this camera. The camera that's in your, in, your, in your game, in your game engine. Why is it a camera? Why is it called that? Why does it have like this aperture? Why do you believe that your eye works this way? Your eye doesn't work that way. That's got nothing to do with your eye. That has to do with like the, the history of photography. You know, but nobody bothers to rethink this stuff. It's easier to just believe that there's a camera in there. And the camera works like a real world camera does. Um, but try to imagine a world where that isn't there, you know, and you get stuff like this, where, you know, she's standing in a building, but it's, she's the most important thing there, so she's the biggest thing, you know, where, you know, the, the, everything's a little wonky, her breast is awfully high up, you know, like, but that's because it's important, it's the thing, you know, it's in the center, it's, you know, if you draw diagonals through these images, you find the focus, you find w a meaning, you know, and, um, it's something that we enjoy trying to connect to, even though we know it's impossible. You have situation in, in art, in old art, where they try to imagine the unimaginable to paint the face of their god. And that's something that now we kind of, you know, we've imagined all kinds of stuff. We've imagined, you know, what it's like to be on Mars, what it's, you know, dragons and orcs and, you know, wars and on alien planets and, you know, but I think I enjoy the idea of connecting to the lore, the canon of this world. And then maybe that's what, why we as Tale of Tales always chose to make our work about existing stories, or most often our work has to do with all of our games was an existing story that we took and found something new in that could be expressed through video games. And the lore of this world is extremely rich, you know? We, we choose to work with Christianity, not out of some deeper religious feeling, but a maybe a desire for feeling more human, um, for finding, connecting, to the pathos that might have been there in the past. Of course, we can only make up stories about this, but that's what's so cool about it. I mean, we have to make up a story in order to make something. We don't know what it was like for this artist, you know, to try and paint the dying Christ and like what that meant for him, you know? We can't even feel that, you know? But at the same time, there's something there for us because this is the art that we're constantly looking at and feeling something about. We may not, we, Michael and I are all, and many other people who like, you know, going to museums and looking at old art, I guess, find something in it that still resonates with us, and we want to, I don't know, understand that better, because we feel like that's something meaningful that we can do with technology that, you know, and the skills that we have right now. Oh, uh, this is good. I should read you a short quote, but it's like in my presenter notes, so I'm going to do this slightly differently. I'm going to split this up. Um, this book called The Symbolism of the Christian Temple by Jean Hany. Um, he's a, a French, um, I don't know what you call him, like uh, 
he stu uh, does huge surveys of sacred art in Amiens, or he did. This is, I don't know what his status is now. But he writes about the sacred, um, this is a really interesting quote, true sacred art is not sentimental nor psychological, but of an ontological and cosmological nature. This being so, sacred art will no longer appear to be the result of the feelings, fantasies, or even the thought of the artist, as with modern art, but rather the translation of a reality largely surpassing the limits of human individuality. Sacred art is the vehicle of the divine spirit. The artistic form allows transcendent and supra-rational truths to be directly and not discursively assimilated, assimilated as in the, is the case with reason. Sacred art, therefore, prolongs the incarnation, the descent of the divine into the created. I love that, but it's... Um, it's not about us in a way, in other words. Like there's a lot of, he's, he starts the book by saying there's a lot of religious art, but there's very little sacred art. What makes art sacred has a lot more to do with ritual, tradition, um, looking at something and saying, what am I looking at? Asking yourself that question and then coming up with uh, an answer that comes in part from within and in part from your culture. It's like really weird to think, but we don't necessarily have the cultural grounding to make anything sacred. So I'm not standing here pretending that when we make our virtual cathedral, that we're making a sacred space strictly. But we're trying to understand what the sacred is because we feel that it, that this is, um, I forget which cathedral this is, and I'm terrible, Rams maybe. But at any rate, the, the slide is here to show like how different this type of architecture is from the architecture that we look at every day. You know, you're in New York City, so I mean, you know what I mean. It's like we have boxes now. This looks like in any, you know, cathedral in France, it always looks like a spaceship landed. It looks like, you know, what, it, what, what am I looking at? What you're looking at is that. You know, it's like those architects, they weren't going to sacrifice structural integrity, but they definitely were trying to encode something about mankind into their architecture. And anybody who knows me knows that I've got a thing for cathedrals, and I always have, and it's in part because of this reason that I've often felt like it was the best example of a narrative, immersive and narrative environment that exists, because everything inside means something. Even the measurements, the way it lays on the land, the way, you know, um, the different art forms are melded inside the, the building. Um, yeah, the different ways that, you know, they make these, you know, I guess, okay, I'll cover two small things. That, but, yeah, okay, the stone, stained glass windows, for example, they're to bring in light, but it's also symbolically important, more than just the stories that are portrayed within it. When we were in Spain, which I'll probably talk about a little bit, but um, there was this, we went to the Cathedral Santiago Compostela and uh, saw mass there. And they did this beautiful thing at a certain point. They, in Catholic mass, there's a point where they s um, burn incense. And in most cathedrals or churches, this is not such a big deal. But here they had this huge incense burner, gigantic, and it took five guys to swing this thing. but. It happens at a very special moment when the sun was shining through the windows at the side so that when they swang the, swung, swung, the incense, it, it hi got highlighted by the sun and you had this total feeling of something divine going on. It was a bit of magic that they were trying to make you feel something at that moment. And, and I was like, okay, well played, you know, you would. Um, we also went to Notre Dame de Haut, which is uh, the Ronchamp Chapel, designed by Le Corbusier. So it's very modern, like definition of modern. But it's amazing as a chapel because you can have service inside or outside. And so he designed it with this in mind. And you know, there's the sacred statue of Maria can simply be turned around to face outside or inside, depending on where the, the service is taking place. It's amazingly well designed and very moving to be there. Um, and that's an example of modern sacred space, which is pretty crazy. Um, I guess, oh yeah, I have these appearing, which is totally unnecessary. Um, 
unnecessary appearing. Um, this was from our trip on the Camino de Santiago, which I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a pilgrimage route. So what it means is that pilgrims, Christian pilgrims will, um, and I don't know how long this has been going on, centuries and centuries, will take these certain roads to the church of Santiago de Compostela, which is at the edge of Spain, and you're supposed to walk, and it's about being forgiven for your sins once you get there. It's like the suffering that you go to on the way there. And uh, there's a relic of St. James there that is inside of this, it's like you walk, th you take this really long walk from like wherever you live in Europe, you, it's incredibly far. I've known people who have walked it, I've known people who have biked it, you know. I've, we were faking it in those photos, we just sort of stopped every now and then and took a photo like, oh, we're doing this. Yeah, um, but anyway, you get there and there's this mad, mad, mad cathedral. It, this is crazy, I can't even photograph this stuff. It's like um, huge, polychrome angels, this is the organ covered in babies, and like, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's out of control, so I can only imagine what this must have been like in the Middle Ages to do this, you know, you get there and there's all this gold, and there's incense, and there's like theatrics, there's the ultimate magic trick of the Eucharist, there's, I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a beautiful thing that we can't experience anymore, and, but Michael and I are interested in giving you other experiences, I guess in the similar vein. Um, there's this thing I have about the labyrinths, um, real quick. Um, it's sort of my favorite part of any cathedral, and a lot of the cathedrals, especially in Flat France, have this thing. A maze is a game, you know? It's like, but in this case, it's a labyrinth, and you know the difference between a labyrinth and a maze. A labyrinth, um, you can take any path and it always leads to the center. In the center is the Minotaur. I mean, a lot of people were wondering, why is this pagan thing in cathedrals? And there's not really an answer for that. It's like, th it's got something to do with the myth of Ariadne and Theseus and Minotaur, and, you know. But, and, it, and they think that maybe it's because something, you know, like the first basilicas in Crete or something, and this was put on there as like a symbol. There's some thinking that about the getting to the center has to do with a pilgrimage again to the Holy Land. And in fact, um, walking a maze, is, uh, walking a labyrinth is something that is extremely meaningful as an activity for a lot of people. And in, and in some sort of thinking, it's, a, a, it's a, a substitute for doing the actual pilgrimage. So it's like, you know, you want to atone for your sins or whatever and be forgiven. So instead of having to walk all the way to the, pil to the Holy Land or to Santiago or whatever, you might just want to, you know, walk the labyrinth and think about what you've done, you know? Um, also, this led to a bunch of games, which I was amused to find, and I kind of, I don't know, I kind of love that there's all this stuff connected to it. But, I mean, there are a lot of games that sort of deal, that sort of via via end up using the symbolism, you know, it, about going on a pilgrimage, going to the center. Um, and there's just something really beautiful about that, that even if you don't know what it means, that you still enjoy it, and that you still um, get something out of it. Um, Anyway, our project, we have nothing. We've done nothing practically except think a whole lot, sketch a whole lot, visit a bunch of, a whole lot of cathedrals and try to understand the mystery. Um, we did a Kickstarter for this project also, which was also successful. I'm pretty happy about that considering we we're gonna give everything away. Um, it's, um, and we say it's VR and we don't know what that means yet and we, um, Wanna, we've, we're going to work with the people who back the project, actually, to come up with certain concepts for um, the chapels. And I mean, we're taking it very literally, I guess, when we say a cathedral, but it's not made of stone. We're not going to pretend like, oh, this is a stone cathedral. For us, it's made of light, maybe, um, made of sound. Um, but we don't want to make anything up, because to us, it's not about that. It's not about us. It's about this thing that's out there, this, the reason that everyone goes to the Sistine Chapel and wants to see this amazing famous thing and then take some like totally inadequate like relic of this experience back, you know? Why I, this is uh, from our cathedral in Ghent, um, St. Bavo's Cathedral, and it's my favorite spot in that cathedral that I captured via photogrammetry and made into a 3D model. 
which I would show you if I didn't have only this week uh, MacBook Air, um, because it's very high res. But, you know, looking at it, and again, looking at my poor craftsmanship, my mistakes, you know, and feeling like, yeah, whenever I look at this 3D model, I still feel like I'm there, you know? And I, how can I make other people feel like they're there? Why do I want them to be there? What is it about, like, as what I feel sacred space can do for people and why I think it's still relevant um, to humanity? Um, this is us, again, in our crazy cathedral there. Um, I don't know how long I've been talking. <laughs> Maybe I should stop. Uh, I'm pretty much done. Yeah, I was going to show a little bit of a video. Maybe I'll show, like... Can you sit for like three minutes maybe? And then we'll, we'll okay, a few minutes, okay.
it's uh, the best time to do sightseeing. It's the middle of the night, honestly. Okay. I'm gonna end it there. Yeah, okay. The Cathedral in the Clouds is something we hope will be a very sincere project. I mean, we're not interested in making fun of anything or being ironic about anything. I'm just gonna say that. Um, there's a lot of issues around it. Like, I'm like, well, are we ready to convert souls? Do we want people to actually believe in this space? Like, you know, since people have this way of believing in technology, do we need to worry that people are gonna take it too seriously? I mean, these are the issues we're sort of thinking about and, and we'll sort of explore. Like, you know, do we have to worry about, you know, starting some sort of, you know, religious war somehow in this virtual space? Will people come and like, you know, want to destroy it, you know? It, for, you know, it's like, it's, it's just a really funny things that you have to think about when dealing with something serious, you know? It's like, because this happens with things that are unserious. This happens with video games all the time. Like, so it, it's kind of a strange thing. We're, we've decided to just, you know, believe in it for ourselves and see who else believes in it. <laughs> I don't mean that in a religious way. I guess I just mean like in, in believes that this project is possible and makes sense somehow because it doesn't always make sense to me. But I think that's the nature of faith maybe. <laughs> So I'm um, just sort of bravely going through with it. Anyway, that was the end of my talk, and I hope it was sort of interesting. Thank you. That was uh, lovely, Aurea. Beautiful. And um, I guess, are we going to do these? It's going to put right, one right in the middle. Brandon, will that work? Uh, hand, it uh, hand it off between us? Okay. Um, so I'm going to, just before we open it up to uh, let people, yeah, have a seat and relax, um, we'll let people ask questions and maybe I'll just ask one or two myself if that's okay. And um, I, uh, so I thought that was great. And, uh, you know, you've done so much different work in different contexts and, and actually it's great to sort of get an overview and, and see the, the way that the different contexts have had such an kind of influence over the meaning of your work and um, and it and it wasn't until tonight and watching you talk about it in this way that I've kind of see this thread of the sacred or the transcendent you know yeah. um, as, as an element that ties your work together um, and I guess my question is like is that was that always there was it there at the beginning there is a sense in which kind of net art and the there was yeah. this 90s moment where computers had that quality of magic and the sacred, yeah. you know, it was Mondo 2000, and there yeah, was a sense in which computers were like drugs, and you know what I mean? It was that what, what drew we you there? We were all going to upload our brains to the, you yeah. know, we were all going to upload our brains to cyberspace at the time. Well, we still are. That was the thing. You know, I mean, that's are still we still wanting to do that? Like, that's still the plan? Still okay, all right. Although now I wouldn't trust it. See, that's the thing. Yeah. It's like. So yeah. was that, so were you. Um, coming from an art background, I mean, you're clearly a gifted artist in terms of just the kind of classical and traditional materials, and were, were you coming from, from that background, and then did you discover computers, and were, were these two uh, things in conversation? Was there like the math and engineering side of your interest in computers, or did you, did you see in computers something that... It was, it was always in conversation, but not from the math and computer side at all, always from the material side, like even before I was into 3D, um, like working at the computer lab at Parsons, like doing photo manipulations, drawing in Photoshop, you know, doing my drawing assignments in Photoshop in 1991 was like controversy, like my teacher was like, you can't hand that in, you can't do that here, you know, what are you thinking? There was no example for computer art because we had forgotten as a people, collectively, what had gone on in the 60s in computer art with, uh, you know, program, like, algorithmic work um, that was usually printed, you know. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a history there, but it definitely was not taught in art schools. And um, so, from, anyway, so from that time, it was always um, interwoven because I loved working with computers, and I just didn't know what to do with them until I saw, saw the web. It's like, I was like, well, I can make this and I can print it out, you know, and I can make it, print it out on weird things. I was always shoving like strange materials into the printer and pr pissing off the, mm -hmm. you know, the text there and stuff. But, um, but for me, it was always a material thing and not a, not a programmy thing, even though programming was sometimes necessary. Um, there's also, so you talk about how we kind of, 
how we forget. Um, there's a sense in which um, we have a super bad short-term memory in in mm -hmm. games. Um, the, you know, and and, and net technology. It's not just games. yeah technology yeah. because we're always looking forward. We're always kind of projecting right. into the future where everything is going to be great. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, so like that net art period is something that a lot of people um, in in alt games and kind of underground games have just recently kind of rediscovered. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of in danger of being lost, right? That tradition yeah, of yeah, yeah. of Jody.org and and well, kind of like that kind of stuff. That right? kind of stuff would never be lost. What's been lost is all the stuff that's not Jody.org, right. which is a lot. I mean, I love Jody. Um, hang out with them, their kids play with our kids, you know, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's like there was a whole environment and a culture, you might say, that was lost that was not just about, like, you know, people who were doing it seriously and calling it art, but, like, a lot of people were just messing around with stuff, messing around with code, messing around with the material, the, what, what things look like, what they felt like, you know, making a mess of your desktop, make, crashing your computer on purpose, you know, like, all kinds of stuff, like, th that was just beautiful, it was amazing, and, and that that really felt like, I mean, it felt like magic because um, you as a creator had direct contact with your audience and they were using the same environment to watch that you were using to create. And it was very um, flat. Anyone could just join in, you know? So that's what I mean. It's like, yeah, we remember, you know, the big names and everything but of, of that time period, but all the rest of it was amazing, and some of it was as simple as conversations going on on, you know, mailing lists, like where people were, you know, making art in emails, almost. Like um, was, code poetry. Was, 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 um, uh, there was this whole thing about code poetry, which like, I don't even think is around. Example, were, na were mailing lists of this type named? Like oh, I mean, yeah, but I mean, yeah, of course, net time. I mean, you know, okay, there's time. a thing, there's still Rhizome, but Rhizome was right. more important as a mailing list back then. I mean, um, Rhizome has sort of morphed into this sort of important off uh, connection with, the, you know, the new museum, but they were just a mailing list like any other, you know? Um, and it was sort of a, a meeting space slash space for action to happen, and it's in a place like that that I met my husband even. So <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. it was full of, like... Um, I don't know, romance, and I know, but see, it's partially because of that time that I'm so suspicious of, I will never be in love with technology again, I think, it's, the love is gone, because I know it will disappear, and no one will remember it, this has happened to me twice, it's like it happened with the net stuff, like, where it was just, super special environment, this amazing t stuff was going on, all these really super creative people pouring their talents into it, and nobody remembers it at all. It's just gone, you know? It's like, and then in the context, is not only the context, but the actual files don't even run anymore because everything's run by corporations who don't give a shit about this stuff. You know, we were breaking their shit, you know, all the time and having a good time while we were doing it, and now they don't they don't care, so they just break our shit, you know? It's like, okay, you break our stuff and that's the end, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the same thing happens with video games it, all the time in the sense that, like, people don't remember the old games, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and it's frustrating, you know? It's like, or, or context changes so hard that you're kind of like, I mean, now no one can understand why the graveyard made any point why, why it was such a big deal in 2008 that we come up with a game with a grandmother you know like whatever you know but at the time this was like we were getting death threats I mean you know it was like you've done something wrong you know and the context is just not there so we can't really explain it and that's our minor minor example or the path I can't even get into like the revisionist history that's gone on with the path people love that game now but when it came out in 2009 again it was just like what have you done you have Sacrilege, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I can't even tell you the amount of hate mail, the, like, I mean, and not just I hate your game, but it was just like, you personally are wrong, you have done something bad and evil, and, and you don't deserve to live, and I hope you die, and I hope your children die, I mean, you know, we're just sitting there like, whoa, 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 you know, calm down, it's just six girls in a room, you know, um, it's really kind of like exciting about doing work that 
that prompts that kind of reaction. Yeah, well, that you is, know, we loved like, it. This is, <laughs> on the one is, hand, this is the I romance mean, of the that's of the, the romance. 20th century avant garde, yeah. breaking people's brains, you yeah. know, by and causing the Philistines to kind of, you know, yeah. uh, freak out right. and and threaten you. Um, and like, so I feel like in a way you guys always um, sought that out, right? I mean, there must have been an element of it that yes you and no, yes and no, yes and no, yes, yes, in the sense that we didn't want to do anything expected, I guess, and because we had our own ideas, but no from the standpoint of we couldn't have done anything else. Like, right. and that was another thing about us in video games. It's sort of like we feel like you were right in a way. Thank like, you. <laughs> yeah, see, and that's, and that's it. For us, Bye. So oh, God. <laughs> Are you recording this? Michael's going to see that and he's going to get so. No, 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 no. No, I mean, in the sense of, yeah, tell, let me tell you about you being right. No, it's just um, that, uh, that maybe what we were trying to do sometimes was uh, uh, just trying to bend we just wanted to create okay i'll, I'll preface it by saying we just wanted to create space where our work could exist and that's something that people talk about a lot now but at the time there was no discussion about this at all and we were alone and or felt alone and you know we're like no we're gonna do this thing you say it's not a game okay it's not a game it's not games you know whatever you know it's like just so that we could make sure that our work could exist but at the same time, this is my personal feeling. This has nothing to do with Michael. I'll just put that disclaimer out there because I don't know what he would say about this. But to me, it feels like at this point, now that the context has shifted and people are making all kinds of things and you know, our work is not so some special, fragile unicorn flower out there, it's like it feels like maybe we were, we were, go we were thinking about it all wrong. <laughs> it's like on a certain level, it feels like now to me that you know, maybe games are what they are, and they are whatever culture wants them to be, you know? And to try and change that is interesting anecdotally, but it's not a permanent thing. It's like, it has to happen maybe more organically, this change, and that is sort of what happened. We pushed it, we pushed it, and I guess people gotta push it, but at the same time, it's like, what were we trying to do? We were trying to make people believe in that romance of it toward another end like it's not about a game it's about being in a forest and you're running and you know and you're a deer and doesn't it feel great to do that you know and like you don't need a game you're a deer <laughs> you know <laughs> like i don't know it's like you it's like game. this is what we were game. trying to do yeah you are a game and you are our game we're gonna come and play with you and the game takes place in your head in the path that is the game is you how you feel about it let me see it. if i can tease this out a little bit more because yeah, um like there's a beautiful that beautiful quote that you had about revelation yeah. um and kind of versus reason and in my mind some of the stuff i mean the, the stuff that you guys liked the least about games, I mean, there's a lot of it, but the fact that there's so much, like, lowbrow, kind of, like, hostile, you know, regressive, like, you know. But, but the, there's also this other thing, which I think, in, a, in some ways, is about this tension between faith and revelation on the one hand and reason on the other. Like, like a quintessential game gamey game like chess or something um, is so much about this kind of cerebral, rational problem solving. Um, and maybe in some ways, was that always part of the tension there? Is that part of what you guys were, were, were playing with, that, that tension between, between just being in a space and, and sort of like opening yourself up to the truth through revelation or through presence? And, and this thing which is in some ways more I don't know if it's more contemporary or, or just like this part of this, this this weird enlightenment project that we're still in where it's it's like, no, that's not enough. You know, yeah. we, we actually have to work these things out step by step using kind of rational thought and logic. Is that is that part of what's going on in this? There's definitely an Apollonian Dionysian thing going on there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah. I mean, in some ways, yeah, where we wanted to get beyond. Okay, when Michael and I were making Net Art, we had this slogan that was, technology is not the future, we are. And we didn't mean us, as in me and him. We meant us, as in humanity, so to speak. It's like, it's not about this technology, it's about you. And so that's why, in a way, we were against all these systems and these sort of layers placed on top of the simulation that you were a part of and be your belief in that world and was broken by, you know, you're in an RPG, so then there's some random battle. That's how it was in the early 2000s. That's always there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why is that there? 
nobody wants to play that, wants to fight that, you know, especially at the beginning part of the, of the RPG. It's like, and you're just leveling up, you know? And it's like, nobody wants to do that. So we're like, why are you even making people do that? This is literally our thought process was just like, why are they making people do that? Why is it like that? It was about what am I looking at when I'm playing a game and not with my eyes, but with, you know, the whole system that's there and wanting to cut out all the parts that are like interfering with my belief in that space, in that world, and then see what was left and what could be done to enhance that emotion to amplify your thought, I guess. And so for us, it was never about programming or math or systems or anything. It couldn't be because we wanted that place to be S yeah, real somehow. Hmm. And I think that that came from that romantic notion that you were there, you know, my playing Tomb Raider and actually standing there and feeling like I was in that place, you know, and it didn't matter what I was doing, you know, they're going to make me shoot an animal now, okay, shoot the animal so I can just go and be in this space some more, you know, hmm. pretty much how I play Tomb Raider. <laughs> you know, there are these, uh, there are different stories that we can tell about video games, about where they come from and where they're going and one of them is that they are not really games. They just, that's kind of like a, they just share as, a, as an accident yeah. of etymology, yeah. this word game. And yeah. in fact, what they are is using computers to create experiences. And some of them have chess-like or tennis-like yeah. qualities, but then they're, they're you know, they, they will evolve into these two different things. Like they will evolve into, on the one hand, I don't know, League of Legends, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, something like Gone Home or, or Firewatch or, yeah, or, or Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's not even a story, that's just reality, because that is happening, right? That so, is happening. But that's one way of framing that. You know, another way of talking about it is that there is something in video game that will always contain this rupture and this tension, right? Yeah. That you can't, nothing can ever, that even in a weird way, gone home is, has these systems in it, right? Yeah. And that, that, it, that it's not just a pure experience, that, it, that, that the fact that it's software, the fact that there's physics, yeah. and that you're kind of, you know, and, um, and, and that League of Legends has this weird, like, lore and this story and these cartoon characters in it, right? And so that what makes a video game are these, these blended things. I just, uh, where, yeah. I'm not sure where you see your work. Or do, you, do you think of, of, of what you guys are doing as kind of leading the way towards this new separate branch that's going to go off on its own and no longer have to deal with this or is it always <laughs> going to happen? I think that's what we hoped for tension. at a certain point. I think that's what we hoped for was that it would be some branch that would sort of go off in another direction but you know I can point out things reasons why that didn't work as such and why it's something else now than what we attended hmm. um, but at the same time you could look at like uh, we, we always give the example of 90s CD-ROMs which you've never heard of and you've never played and that's another lost thing. But it was so inspirational for us, and they were made by all kinds of people. They weren't just made by game designers. In fact, they weren't even games. Nobody f even felt the need to call them games. They just called them CD-ROMs. There's this thing you do with your CD-ROM drive because CD-ROM drives were new. And so people wanted to put something in their CD-ROM drive, so it spawned this whole art form. Literally, there are, there are libraries of these things. I mean, there, there's so many of these things were made, and they're, they're sometimes poetry. They were mu made by musicians. They were, you know, s interactive, and like you clicked and pointed. I mean, it was very low tech because computers couldn't do a whole lot it wasn't necessarily 3d but they sort of opened up a whole other world or a whole other format um and and i felt like that was going to go somewhere too and it didn't you know it just died because web you know or because you know you could download everything and you suddenly didn't want to do that stuff anymore and who knows why you know and i kind of feel like that's um what happened to what we wanted in a funny way is that it kind of just died. I mean, there's other stuff happened and all that's really interesting, you know, but what we wanted, which is hard to articulate maybe after a couple of drinks, but you know, it's just that, um, it's, we wanted there to be this whole other thing, indeed, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that could happen that nobody even questioned, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, it's like over there. Maybe it can still happen. Maybe it's I mean, the, the, the difference between feeling like you've got to do it all, like you've got to bundle everything, to, like the CD-ROM had to like be everything at once and, and the video game for a long time had to, because you only got one, right? You had got one video game for Christmas and so it had to <laughs> have the random battles, which yeah, were like yeah, little yeah. chess games, but yeah. then it also was a big story and a world yeah. you could explore. And, and maybe now, things are, now that things are, you know, computation is cheaper and bandwidth is broader, we can specialize and we no longer feel the need to have to do it all. Yeah. 
yeah. I don't know. And maybe it's wise to not try to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to so say. So now you can, you can specialize yeah. in just opening up a gateway to heaven and giving yeah, people a glimpse exactly. of the infinite. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> right? Why not? Why not? Um, let's, let's, <laughs> let's go to the audience for yeah. some questions. Yeah. Does he um, have to? No, no, no. We'll, okay. we'll shout him back. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, I just have a question on preservation, and you've mm -hmm. sort of lamented the various eras and scenes that have sort of died out because yeah. they weren't well preserved technologically, software, the infrastructure, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, but can you point as a counterpoint to um, organizations or techniques or mm -hmm. software that is doing right for preservation now? Oh, man. With technology, it's really complicated because, and it's complicated by money. It's complicated by what I was talking about with these people who are questioning, like, who holds the data. It's, it's okay, for example, in the 90s, like, there was a big push for museums to collect web pages, believe it or not. So like SFMOMA, Walker Art Center, like all these places have collections of web pages from that time. Like, you know, now it's like, I can't point to anything specific at all, but I'm not, which is not to say it's not out there. But it's, it's just always fraught because I know, for example, I've talked to archivists at places like the MoMA, whenever they collect digital stuff, they're like, well, how do we preserve this? Do we keep the computer that it was running on? How long is that going to last? We keep spare batteries because the battery is going to die. You know, When they do backups of videos, it's like they have like a five-year plan or a three-year plan or something. You know, Every three years, they're going to have to copy it to new media. You know. It, because that drive is going to die, you know, because that technology is not going to exist or something. You know, it's like, it's, um, I don't know that there is a way to preserve digital data, actually, and I think that anyone who preserved digital data will say the same thing, that there might not be a way to do it. The real thing for me, actually, is that to preserve the context around a piece, um, which happens, I think, really well in like the dance world, for example, you know, of um, artistic dance troops and stuff, they, they keep they, they'll publish, like, you know, like, the, the reviews, they'll have a video, they'll have a, you know, I don't know, it's like translating it into all these other media somehow makes it easier to capture something that was very fleeting. I mean, obviously, you can't, even a video of a dance performance is not the dance performance, or a theater performance, for that matter. It's like, so maybe there's, I mean, and I know others have thought, okay, maybe there's something we can learn from this sort of strategy, where it's about all the stuff around it how it was perceived, how, you know, rather than the data itself, um, uh, which might be interesting, because that's always my frustration um, about our games, is that they live on in people's memory and in YouTube videos, endless, endless Let's Plays, but at the same time, you don't get that, like, what was this like at the time to play it? You know, you, you've done this, you play old games in the library here, and you can't even control them, because the control scheme is, like, just feels weird and you don't know how it's supposed to work anymore and like and it's almost unplayable because the 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 patience that people had to play in a certain style at that time is just not existent anymore um you can't you can't preserve that you can't preserve the patience that it took to to do that and a video is not good enough obviously for a game um yeah so anyway there's a lot of um, things around that yeah Hi, Hi. I, I know your work very well um, I was very inspired by it when uh, I was in school. I'm a veteran of the RML back in the 90s. Hey, hey, thermal. Yeah, okay. But I wanted to speak to what you were just saying just now. I heard um, a, a talk from the founder of Rizome. The founder of Rizome gave a talk, okay. Yes, uh -huh. he mentioned that uh, he has a way of preserving it and uh, viewing some of those old Ah, oh. really? Yes. Yeah. Was this was this Mark Tribe or John Ippolito or or someone like this? There's been a ton of initiatives lately, actually, and this goes back to your question, like archive.org. I don't know if you've noticed, they have like wicked, mad, crazy, great emulation going on on archive.org. Yeah, big shout out to those guys. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. Great. It is really good. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you go there and you are starting up an instance of Windows 98 and you are playing, you know? It's really it's, amazing. They're, and it's all done in JavaScript, you know? And you're just sitting there like, how the hell did you do this? You know, it's like, 
really beautiful. Anyway. Yeah, yeah that's the solution. I mean, maybe it, that's maybe a good, it will that's get solved. That's a good solved. example. Maybe that's data, a good example. Maybe it will get, and maybe yeah. it's the, the folks at archive.org that will do it. Yeah. Uh, I think I have time for a couple more questions. I won't, I'm going to get to you, but I'm going to make sure. Is there anyone in the back? I don't want to get... Uh, 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 okay, there we go. Boom. Go there, Yell then it. there, then there. Yeah. Up? Okay, go. Uh, so I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of curious about this notion of, uh, kind of code and software and these kind of like purely logical systems as a sort of a means to an end, right? Because, mm. um, you know, like I, um, you know, I know I've, I've definitely had experience with trying to you know, trying to build a, like you know some piece of software that conveys a particular feeling, and it ends up resulting in some kind of hideous logic problem. And I have this thought that, oh my God, if I could do this with just like some two by fours and a hammer and some nails, this would be way better, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I, I don't know. Theoretically, that like if if you if you had infinite time, mm -hmm. that you could you know whatever you know whatever these kind of spaces are that that you're trying to explore in your work, if you could like build them physically if you had all the oh, time and all the resources. Uh -huh. Would that be something that you would find preferable? Or is there something about the abstraction and malleability of software that you find preferable? There's absolutely something about this software. Like the fact that it's it doesn't actually exist that is appealed to us all this time. Um, that's been a big thing. The, rep the fact that you can replicate it. It's why we always felt stupid selling it. It's like, you're going to sell this thing that you can just copy like endlessly. What a waste, you know? It's like, yeah, it's like, it's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, that's why now we're thinking more about like, will people pay, it, pay us for the process or for something like that rather than the product, you know, because we think it's just silly to think of this as a product. And no, making stuff like this in reality is not something that would replace the software for me at all. Um, it's, it's definitely always been about the software. I mean, it's like, it took me a while actually to get back into using physical things. For the longest time I would not draw on paper because I just felt like, well, you're killing trees. I've got like endless paper right here, you know, like, um, so it was like a psychological thing for me to get back into making analog art. And that's why it was significant that I've been doing so much of it lately. Cause it's just like, and even now I feel like a oh, paint, paint, you know, even though I love oil paintings. I mean, these are like, this is the thing that, it, one of the things I love most in the world is like all these oil paintings. And I, when I do it myself, I just sit there like, yeah, yeah, you know, it, I love it too, but it's like, whatever, you know? <laughs> and I, and I, and I don't think that, you know, when, in, like your logic problem thing, you know, where you end up in a, in a knot or whatever. We once did a research project called Drama Princess, uh, those who remember it, like, <laughs> it was like where we wanted to invent an AI um, that uh, like a character that could live in a game, you know, and not not have to, you know, that would do unexpected things, all that sort of stuff. After we played Black and White One, we were like in love with AI, because um, we just, I don't know, that game was flawed, but it was beautiful flawed. Like, um, and so we discovered that the best way to like make people believe, for example, a character loved them was to make them love the character. It's like, you know, the ca believe that this character loves you. You know, how do you make someone believe that the character loves them and then you love it back? You know, it like, it, things like that. And so it turned out we didn't need p complicated programming at all. All we needed was to make it people believe enough in the character, like in what it was doing. And then we use this in the path. And I think that's why people love the path so much is it's just like the AI is really dumb and is poorly programmed and we know that, you know? But at the same time, people feel for these girls. They are like empathetic with these girls because occasionally these girls go off and do their own thing. Occasionally their AI kicks in and they go do something. And then people are like, oh no, what are you doing? You know? And it's like, so we don't need complicated solutions. You know, it's like, you don't, you don't need a complicated, this is, I'm here, mm. but you don't need a complicated solution. You know, what you need is to think about how people are going to react to whatever it is you're giving them and try to simulate that reaction more or less, depending on what you're trying to do. Nice. And there's all kinds of tricksy ways of doing that that don't require, when we once had a little girl, like in our, the little girl in our prototype for eight, and the way that we made people th feel she was more real, rather than writing AI, was just have when she's walking down a hallway, she would touch the wall. You know, like reach out and like touch the, run her hand along the wall like a little child would, like they're skipping along, they're like la 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 la. And it just felt like, I mean, this was long ago and like characters weren't that as sophisticated as they are now, so it's like little things like that 
you know, even playing Ico at the time, that game Ico, like, everyone felt so, like, strongly for that character, and it's because, well, he had this really, really wicked cool idol animation that you just felt like, oh, he's gonna fall, you know, no, he's looking at the, you know, it just, their idols are so beautiful that you believe they live, you know, and it's like, you don't have to write anything for that, no programming involved, just a good animator, That's you know. That's such good advice. <laughs> That's <laughs> such good advice. Um, yes. Yeah. I really liked what you were saying about sacred places and yeah. how they touch us in an epistemological way that yeah. things that sort of transcends everything else. And I also liked what you were saying about how we don't, we can't see things like they, we saw them during the Renaissance, and that's why these paintings have this sort of like specialness to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost wondering, like, because of how like indoctrinated we are into how we use tech, do you feel like we can still make sacred places? Do you feel like? that's still a place that we can feel? It's, it's super hard because of the, the, I read that quote because I was trying to point out the fact that it's not about individuality and that's something we cannot get past right now because our whole society is built on the fact that you're an individual, you're an individual, we're all individuals here. We are all flowers in a field, unique, each one, snowflakes, you know. Um, and, and that, the sacred is something that you can only be gotten to through the collective through this idea that, you know, you, the belief that you are going to go to hell if you're not a good person, you know, you can let go of that and go, okay, I'm going to hell, but you still believe it, you know. It's like, and underneath it all, I mean, and this is the, the what I feel is something that underneath it all, we all believe that stuff anyway. It, we we st all still believe in all the, like, tenets of Christianity, all of us sitting here. And that's because it is built into everything, our whole, all our laws, all our ideas, oh, we're not going to kill people, you shouldn't rob people, you should love your parents, you know, all these, like, basic things. It's all, like, you know, sort of religious, but it's older than that. It's older than Christianity. It's like, you know, we, but it's, at some point, somebody just codified this stuff, and it's been built into all of us. And I think that the thing with me and Michael and religion has always been we're just not afraid to admit that that's part of us in a way. Like, we're like, well, we can make art about the Bible. It doesn't matter if we're religious. It's like, we're not going to make fun of it, you know, because this is us. This is the thing that is in our society. I think it, it, when you live in a Catholic country, it's a bit different. Like, Belgium is Catholic. Netherlands is Protestant, but Belgium is Catholic. And I think Catholic Catholicism is way more ambient, like, um, in a way that, I don't know, is more tangible than Protestantism. Protestantism likes to be pretend that we don't believe that stuff anymore. It's, we're all atheists here, you know. But it's not true. <laughs> I mean, on a certain fundamental level, it's not true because simply because we are where we are. We, we were born here, and this place was founded on this, and it's still in there underneath it all. And uh, you shouldn't be afraid of that fact that it was there, that it's still here, you know. Um, you can't get rid of it. It's it would take uh, something really strong to like get rid of. It. I mean, I don't know, bombs, apocalypse, you know, whatever. Video games. But video games. <laughs> video games will ruin this. No, no, no. Or save us all. Or save us all. <laughs> yeah, video games um, will save us yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah, I have a quick remark and a question. Yeah. I wanted to say that um, one of my favorite games is Eve from Peter Gabriel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And Eve from Peter Gabriel, Gabriel, shout out. No, you can't play it now. And it's okay. <laughs> it's still with me. Yeah. And I'm studying to be a game designer now. And my games are going to be influenced by that. And yeah. I just want to just tell you that that your stuff, which is unusable, never nobody's going to see it, it's still with people. And it's unerasable, just like you said about the Christian yeah. things right now. So ah. it's, it still ties in. To, to the future, and that's how we always build culture, and we never could save the context, and like not even 10% of those Gothic churches are here. Yeah. And it's, it's still there, so this is the way it goes. And I just want to tell you that, that the, uh, your output is more Im mm -hmm. like important than you might think, mm -hmm. so you shouldn't be too cynical. And my question, you had this one, one point where you s just really quickly in one breath said this, thing about the, the the problem of games having no uh, literacy that people yeah. uh, or like the problem that we want literacy kind of mm -hmm. or that people dictate how FPS controls work yeah, in games yeah, yeah. now and stuff and I wanted to show my game yesterday to the guy I'm sleeping at here in New York and mm -hmm. he I just I just booted it up and he said like but I can't play games 
Right. And, and that was horrible. I think that's horrible that yeah. I have something I made and I will show it to this guy and it's just not. And he said that I can't. Yeah. So, but at the same time, you said we shouldn't homogenize it. We should. Yeah. Well, I don't so think homogen. <laughs> it's this is a huge <laughs> like thing because there are some people. Yeah, game culture is such that some people think they can't play games for reasons that have nothing to do with their motor control. It has more to do with the, how they perceive games, who they're for, who games are for, who made them, like what games are, than it has to do with... So when he says, I can't play games, it has nothing to do with the control scheme, most likely. I've had people be like, oh, I love... We'll pl show the path at a festival, and there'll be all these women playing, and they'll be like, oh, this is really fun, this is great, this is wonderful, and I'll be like, yeah, you should download it, and they'll be like, no, no, I'll give it to my child, you know, my son, I'll tell him, he'll download it. And I'm like, you were just playing it, you know? And like, and it's, 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 it's got more to do with a cultural brain thing, and so you should shouldn't let that be the reason why you try to make homogenous controls because that's not the point you know what you need to do is change game culture such that people don't feel like they have to say I can't play games because they're like I have never played a game when they're probably gonna go to the train and whip out Candy Crush anyway and it's like you know come on you know <laughs> it's like you play games all the time you know or they've played poker or they've played chess or they've played you know a million games you know and it's like it's it's because video games have this weird stigma that does not go away and it doesn't wash off and like and and even no matter what we tried to do it still didn't help that and I think that was another the thing I didn't bring up about why we didn't want to make games anymore is because no matter what we did, we couldn't change that, that or, feeling. Or maybe you did. Or maybe, maybe we you did. did. <laughs> change it. Right? A little bit. For whom, though? I yeah, know. I don't know. I, I it's like not enough, you're you know? Is that you, you so you're telling me not to be cynical. Yeah, that <laughs> that's a real tall order, because I, I, I am like true. the world's I, most jaded. No. I'm going to say that, I think, <laughs> that so I think you may have had a much bigger impact than you realize. Yeah, I know. Um, that from the inside, of course, it, it doesn't, it, you can't see it. Yeah. It's very hard to see it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, I think over time, I think you will maybe recognize the, the, yeah. the, the impact that you've had and, and that it will continue yeah. to, to reverberate out and change. And yeah, change we're, not, we're not running away or anything. Right. I mean, we'll still be around. And, and like I said, we're, you know, not making games. But, you know, uh, I appreciate your comment, actually, a lot about, like, how... And I, that is true, that it is, like, sort of culture builds on other things. You know, it, it goes on. And I think that's really special so you're not going anywhere but i do think we should wrap it up for yeah. tonight um and uh real quick where do people go to find out more about cathedral in the cloud cathedral in the clouds dot net and what if they wanted to like uh, follow your patreon join your 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 oh. patreon What's if you, that? If you just go to taleoftales.com, there's links to all okay. this stuff. Just Google us. Join Aurea's <laughs> um, uh, Patreon. Don't join Michael's Patreon. Let's don't join support, Michael's Patreon. Let's support Aurea. No, 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 no. Exclude, no. Um, thank no. you so much for coming. Cool. This was fantastic. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And it was wonderful. Thank you. Yay.